many familiar names. Um, I also see some new names. So we're so glad you found us if this is your first uh, event with, with uh, and the Legacy. We are Genetic ALS and FTD and the Legacy, an organization dedicated to the needs and interests of the Genetic ALS and FTD community. I'm the chair, Gene Swidler. I carry the C9R72 repeat expansion. And we are so happy to uh, have this talk today. Um, at the end, there'll be time for a Q&A. Feel free to raise your hand or um, put it in the chat. Uh, with that, I will kick it over to our um, guest speaker, um, Dr. Jenna Gregory. Um, so please take it away. I will just share my presentation. Can you see that? You, is everyone able to see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Amazing. Um, and can you see my arrow on the screen as well? Yes. It's very small, but uh, it's there. Excellent. So thank you so much, Jean. It's such a such a pleasure to come and talk to you. And thank you, everyone, for, for spending time um, here listening to this. Um, my name is Jenna Gregory. I'm a senior clinical lecturer, um, associate professor at the University of Aberdeen. And I spend my time roughly 50% um, in the lab where I do my research, interested in ALS research. And I spend half my time as a clinician in the hospital where I'm a pathologist. And um, I'm based in Aberdeen. So Aberdeen is up on the northeast coast of the United Kingdom. So in Scotland, nestled between the sea and the mountains, the Grampian Mountains, it's a beautiful location in Scotland. And the University of Aberdeen is an old university. So founded in 1495. And so because it's an old university, we have these beautiful historic buildings in Aberdeen and we're also right next to the beautiful east coast um, of Scotland where we have these gorgeous castles on the beaches and amazing seabird colonies. Um, but despite this being an old university, I'm very privileged to be able to work in this brand new building, the Institute of Medical Sciences um, at the university. Um, and um, I'm making it sound very idyllic. We do have one problem in Aberdeen, and that problem okay. is these guys. Um, these these got a webinar going on. Total, yes, I've got a webinar going. And there's a bus in the background for perspective, so you can see that these guys are about the same size as a bus, and it means that you can't eat your lunch outside. But other than that, it's a beautiful place for us to do work, and I'm delighted to be here to share some work with you. So as a pathologist, um, I actually specialize in gut pathology, and I'm hoping by the end of this presentation to be able to convince you that it's actually really important to have GI gut specialists, gastrointestinal tract specialists working in the ALS research field and clinically. Um, and so this is an example of a biopsy of somebody's colon. Um, and th this is something that I report day in, day out. This is bread and butter of my job. And I report thousands of these every year. Um, and these are taken from patients who have a change in bowel habit. Um, so perhaps increased frequency or constipation or abdominal pain. And they're being investigated um, by colonoscopy and then a series of biopsies that are taken and sent to me. And I'm looking for things that might explain symptoms. So um, things that I might be looking for, signs of inflammatory bowel disease or infections um, or any colitis. Um, but the majority of cases look like this, where we report them as completely normal. Um, this person um, actually went on to develop ALS two years after this biopsy was taken. And I'll come back to this biopsy in a little while um, to talk about why it's important to be looking at gut biopsies. So to start off with, um, protein aggregation is really what we're talking about in, in ALS. Um, and, and um, where we're looking is in the motor cortex, so in the region that controls movement in the body. And that's towards the front end of the brain here. And within this region, we have these cells um, called motor neurons, and these are the cells that are responsible for controlling movement. And within these cells in people with ALS, there are protein aggregates. These are clumps of proteins that prevent the normal functioning of the cell because they're taking up space in the cell and also because they have intrinsic um, toxicity as well. So they're, they're causing problems within these motor cells, which means that um, there then are problems with movement. 
The thing with uh, protein aggregation is that it's not unique to ALS and it's actually, um, so the protein that is, is seen to aggregate predominantly in ALS is called TDP43. And in some cases you also see SOD1 protein aggregate. So not just TDP43, it's just the majority of TDP43. Um, but it's not unique to, to ALS. Also in Parkinson's disease, we see a pro protein aggregates called alpha-synuclein. And in Alzheimer's disease, we see protein aggregates called amyloid beta and tau. Um, and so really this kind of unifying feature of neurodegenerative diseases, so not just ALS, but also Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, is the presence of these protein aggregates. So what I want to convince you of is that these diseases aren't restricted to the brain and spinal cord. And actually, um, this process of protein aggregation affecting the way neurons function can happen in other um, organs as well. And obviously, I'm interested in the gastrointestinal tract, like many others are. And I um, came to be interested in the gastrointestinal tract in ALS because I was aware of these three studies that were part of the journey that I was making towards making this realization. And the three studies that I'll talk to you about, the first one um, is a study that was conducted by um, an amazing neuropathologist called Heiko Brack. Some of you may have heard of him before. Um, he's, he's a bit of a hero of mine in the way, a bit like uh, Gene is, that he was very anti-dogma. He wanted to challenge received wisdoms and he wanted to really challenge the way we thought about um, particularly Parkinson's disease initially in, this, in these earlier stages. Um, and he was interested in understanding why people with Parkinson's disease experience gastrointestinal problems, um, not just constipation, but also abdominal pains and um, um, problems with reflux and um, problems with swallowing. And so part of this study that was done in 2006, he looked at um, patient material that was taken at post-mortem from the stomach um, of, of a series of patients. And what he found was these black dots present in the stomach tissue are alpha-synuclein aggregates. So this was the first report of pathology, protein aggregation outside of the brain years before these people went on to develop Parkinson's disease. It was the first report of, um, of aggregation in these tissues. So he was seeing these protein aggregates in the stomach, and this was the drawing that he put it, he included in this paper. And he was hypothesizing that these aggregates start off, this is the, um, on the right-hand side of this drawing is the um, inner insides of the stomach, so where you do your digestion. The role of the stomach is to um, squash up food, to, to break it up, to make it more digestible. And to do that, the stomach needs to be able to contract muscles, and for that, it requires neurons. And those nerve cell neurons are in the wall of the stomach, so just behind the um, inside bit. And he was thinking that these aggregates start off on the inside bit, they then spread to these neurons, and then they transmit up to the brain through the nerve that connects the gut and the brain. And this nerve is called the vagus nerve or the vagal nerve. And so there is this physical connection between the gut and the brain called the vagus nerve. And he was hypothesizing that these aggregates originate in the gut and then spread up to the brain. Um, this was the first report of that. There have been many more um, subsequently. The second study um, that I was aware of and was part of this journey that I was taking was around a paper that came out in, um, about 13 years later. So 13 years later, noting what Heiko Brack had seen in 2006, um, these um, investigators injected aggregates of alpha-synuclein into the gut of a mouse that mouse then went on to develop Parkinson's disease. If you cut that connection, the physical connection between the gut and the brain, so this vagus nerve, they call it vagotomy, so cutting the vagus nerve between the gut and the brain, if you cut that connection, those mice, even though you were putting aggregates into their gut, never developed Parkinson's disease. So it required, so you could have Parkinson's disease starting off in the gut and going up to the brain, but it requires a physical connection between the brain and the gut. Um, and this image was very striking from that paper, um, looking at a brain region that um, where, where, where we see Parkinson's disease, the midbrain. You can see in this green stain, there's lots of alpha-synuclein aggregates, these protein aggregates present in the brain of this mouse, um, but there's none at all in the mouse that had had that physical connection cut. And the third and final study that really started me thinking about ALS um, was this study conducted in Sweden. So this was done in Stockholm. 
This group took every single biopsy that had ever been reported in their database and they looked at um, features that, that occurred following um, this di diagnosis from gut biopsies. And what they showed was that if someone had had a gut biopsy taken, so that is somebody presenting with altered bowel habits or reasons why you might need to have a colonoscopy and biopsies taken. So if they had a gut biopsy, but this was reported as normal, so exactly the same as this biopsy that I showed you earlier, those people were more likely to go on to develop ALS. So if they had a biopsy, so they had symptoms, but nothing was picked up on at the biopsy pathology report, they were more likely to develop ALS. And that made me think perhaps we're missing something in these biopsies. I'm reporting thousands of these every year. Am I missing something that I can't see with this ordinary um, HME stain? And could I be detecting disease? That means that I could um, be including people into clinical trials to help them to improve symptoms of their gut um, symptoms, but also perhaps even prevent these aggregates spreading up to the brain. So the question when I'd seen these studies and also many other studies that have, have come out subsequently was, does pathology exist? Do these protein aggregates exist outside of the brain in ALS? So to do this, we um, conducted a study that was just published earlier this year. And we started off with a cohort of um, patients, people who had ALS. Um, all of these people had donated their tissue to the Edinburgh Brain Bank, um, so had made a, a, an ultimate donation of their brain to research. So I knew in these all of these people that they had TDP43 aggregates in their brain. So I wanted to see if they also had it in their peripheral tissues. Now in Scotland, all tissue that's taken during life is collected in biorepositories that can be used for research. So that means, for example, you might have had your appendix taken out for appendicitis when you were younger, or you might have had your gallbladder taken out for gallstones, or you might have had um, your tonsils removed or biopsies of your gut taken. And these are all surgical biopsies that are taken during life. And so um, in this way, we were able to, to um, from these patients, see what tissues had been taken during life and then have a look at whether there was pathology present in those tissues. And for all of these tissues, they were all taken prior to symptom onset. So all of these tissues that we examined were taken before people had developed any motor symptoms at all. And this is what we found. We found on the right hand side in this box lots of tissues where there was no evidence of phospho TDP43 aggregates, so these, these protein aggregates. There was no evidence of them in the thyroid, nothing in the lungs, nothing in the um, female and male genital organs, nothing in the bladder. But we found several organ systems that did have evidence of TDP43 pathology, so this protein aggregation pathology in ALS years before people developed symptoms, motor symptoms. And so just like Heiko Brack showed, we saw aggregates in the GI tract in both the gallbladder and the colon. And we also saw some cases had involvement of skin biopsies and um, a lymph node that was involved all of these years before um, they developed symptoms in various cells of the body. Um, and this was just really to illustrate the timeline here that disease onset or symptom onset here, that these tissues were years prior to that symptom onset. So the gastrointestinal tract two years before, the skin biopsies between one and 11 years before, and the lymph node. One of the lymph nodes that we examined actually was taken 14 years before someone had their first symptom of ALS, and we were able to detect TDP pathology in that lymph node. So... One of these biopsies from this study was this colon biopsy that I showed you at the beginning. So this is a biopsy of a colon from a person who went on to develop, two years later, went on to develop ALS. So at this time, they didn't have any motor symptoms of ALS. It was reported as normal. There were no signs of colitis or anything that was um, concerning on the h &E image. But when I go back and I stain for TDP43, there are aggregates present within this bowel biopsy. So we were missing occult protein aggregates present in the bowel before someone went on to develop ALS. Another case, a gallbladder this time, um, gallbladder part of the GI tract um, secreting bile into the upper GI tract, so into the small intestine. 
we saw in this case in the myenteric plexus, so in the same nerve plexus that Heiko Brack was seeing aggregates in Parkinson's disease, we saw aggregates um, in ALS, these protein aggregates present in the same um, plexus of neurons, in these large neurons and also in these smaller ones. At the top end of this biopsy um, is the inside bit of the gallbladder, which is where bile's collected. And you can see that these aggregates are very, very close to this bile. Um, the presence of aggregates in the gallbladder is, is interesting from the perspective of Parkinson's disease as well. Um, if you've had your gallbladder removed for gallstone disease, you have an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. And also people have shown on imaging that the gallbladder um, has, has very poor contractility. So it's not able to contract to get bile to go into the small intestine. Um, in, implying that its nerve plexus is damaged in the same way that Heiko Brack found in those stomachs years ago. In these cases, we also saw evidence of protein aggregation in the blood vessels. This is a blood vessel cut end on, um, and you can see in the inside bit of the blood vessel would be where the blood is, where the red blood cells are, and you can see um, that there are these brown dots which are TDP43 aggregates, so protein aggregates on the inside of these blood vessels. So that really leads us to think that these could be possible early diagnostic or disease progression markers. So as I was saying before, the gallbladder, that's this little green guy here, he collects bile, he secretes it into the upper GI tract, so into so you've got um, from the mouth you've got the food pipe that goes down into the stomach, and then from the stomach the small intestine, and then the large intestine in this darker pink. So the gallbladder is putting bile into the small intestine and we know that there's aggregates, protein aggregates in the, in the gallbladder. And I've shown you from that um, colon picture that we see aggregates in the colon as well. And so we see aggregates in the start of the GI tract as well as the end of the GI tract. Because the gallbladder is secreting bile, bile is what gives um, stool samples the brown colour. Um, and so we know that bile is mixing with um, the contents of the intestine. And that leads us to think that if we're seeing aggregates in there, that this could be detectable um, in fecal samples, especially as the um, contents of the intestine will have been in contact with these aggregates all the way throughout the length of the intestine. We're also interested in looking in blood samples, given that we're seeing these aggregates very close to um, the inside bit of the, of the blood vessels. And so currently we've just received funding to be able to look in um, blood and faecal samples for signs of, um, of protein aggregates. And remember, these biopsies, this tissue, was all years before someone developed motor symptoms. And so really giving us a possible um, point at which we might be able to detect disease in an early stage and prevent it from um, developing in the brain. But to do this, and what we have received funding for, we need better detection tools. Um, so this is an example of something that we're doing currently to see if we can detect these aggregates in a, in a more um, sensitive fashion. So what we currently use, if we were trying to detect a protein, so say this blue line was a protein, and we're trying to detect it, we use antibodies. And these antibodies bind to a very specific part of the protein, and we use those for detection. The trouble is, as I've shown you before, and as you've seen in those images that I've showed to you, TDP43 isn't um, a long string unfolded. It folds, it misfolds, and it accumulates in these large aggregates. These antibodies then can't detect this part of the protein that it normally um, likes to bind to because it's buried inside this aggregate. And so antibodies aren't necessarily sensitive enough to be able to detect these aggregates. So what we've done is design these very, very small molecules. I've just used this triangle to illustrate it, but actually these molecules are 200 times smaller than an antibody. These molecules, RNA aptamers, we call them, we've published it earlier, um, just towards the end of last year. Instead of recognizing a part of the protein, they recognize the shape of a protein. And that means that they can recognize the outside of these aggregates. So what we see, and because they're so small, really so small, 200 times smaller than this antibody, it means you can put lots of them onto a single aggregate so that amplifies the signal much, much more. And so this is what it looks like. So each of these dots here, um, so there's four panels here. Each of them on the left is what we see with our RNA aptima. And on the right is what we use with these classical approach with an antibody, so in the gray. So you can see that um, 
we can detect things that are so, so small that even the antibodies can't detect. But even in larger aggregates, we can actually detect really impressive um, surface structural details, which an antibody just really does, isn't able to. And so using this, these are individual aggregates visualized within um, biofluids from patients. And so we can really get this single aggregate resolution to be able to detect these, um, these protein aggregates. And given that we think that they're present um, in these samples in blood and in, um, in fecal samples, we may well be able to detect early stages of the disease process. So why is it so important to detect these proteins outside of the brain? So first of all, um, I, want to, um, I want to answer this by showing you some data that we've compiled. Um, and so just to explain how we compile data, we call it evidence synthesis. Um, if somebody does a very small study, so say, for example, they are just um, looking at a rare mutation or something, and they, they actually only can include four or five participants in that study, it's very difficult to make a definitive conclusion because the study is so small. But if 10 studies look at five participants, that's 50 participants. And so pooling all of those studies together using um, advanced statistics, we can pool all of that information. And using that, we can then see if we can make a definitive conclusion. And the way we do it is using something called a systematic review and meta-analysis. And what happens So some of the graphs that I'll show you in a moment are where we've done this with ALS research. Um, you have this T bar, you have a line down the center and a line across the bottom. On the bottom, you can see one side favors control and one side favors treatment. Each of these blue um, squares with lines through them are an individual study. And so each study, um, this study will conclude that the true value of that study is somewhere along this line. Um, a very small box is a small study size, a very large box is a very big study size. So we give more weight to a study that's got a bigger sample size because they're more likely to be more precise. And we take all of these studies and we summarize them. We summarize them in this black diamond. And so on the graphs that I show you, you want to watch this black diamond. If the black diamond is on one side of the line, the central line, we call this line in the center, the um, line of no effect. So if the black diamond is to one side, it favors treatment. If it's to the other, it favors control. And if it touches the line, it's totally inconclusive. So in this example showing you here, this conclusion favors treatment. This conclusion favors control because the diamond's on this side and this one's touching the line, so it's inconclusive. So using these methods, we synthesized evidence from many studies. So the ones at the top left here, this was looking to see if there's path up pathology, these protein aggregates in ALS models, so in animal models. And what we see is that there is, there's this black diamonds on the left-hand side, so it's not in the line of no effect, and we're seeing protein aggregates in experimental models. This is also related to gut motility. So what we see is this black diamond again on one side versus the other. So controls have better gut motility than experimental models. So what we're seeing is even in experimental models that there are there is pathology in the gut um, and that um, this is affecting the motility and, and giving those mice symptoms. Why is that important? So going back to that question that I asked on the previous slide, why is it important to detect pathology in the gut and even you know outside of the brain years before people get symptoms and these two graphs on the right are really um, important in illustrating that because we might be able to treat ALS early on so what we're seeing is when we synthesize the data looking at the effect of gut targeted therapies so these are therapies that are just targeting the gut they're not toxic drugs that have to cross the blood brain barrier these are drugs that are just affecting the gut so things like high fiber diet probiotics when you target these therapies to the gut you can improve motor function as well as survival we already have enough data to show that that's the case in yellow, these studies were conducted in humans. Um, the ones not highlighted in yellow were conducted in animal studies. And so really, why is it important? Because it may well give us um, an early intervention point and a way of treating people um, in, in, a, in a much safer way, but also very important for gene carriers who may well want to, um, to, to use gut-targeted therapies if they're aware that they have um, gut-related pathology to be able to prevent disease 
progression. This study um, is, is the one that was conducted in humans. What they showed was that dietary fibre, they looked at 272 participants. And in those 272 participants, um, they looked at survival. And when you look at survival curves, you want to look um, in the black line is, is untreated. And as you go, if you go to the right of that line, so if, if these lines are to the right of it, then that shows that there's an improvement in survival. And so what you can see is the ones in grey in the dotted line um, are the ones that have more fibre, dietary fibre, so they have an improved survival. That effect was really driven by vegetable fibre fiber in particular. And so the more fibre these individuals had, the more improvement in survival they noted. Um, the reason why this, this group hypothesised that this is the case is because the bacteria that like to eat vegetable fibre produce um, a chemical called butyrate. And actually, uh, butyrate's been tested in lots of animal models. This is just from a SOD1 mouse model showing that there's an improvement in survival because that green line has moved to the right of the red line. And that's the treatment with butyrate. So it's improved survival in the mouse model. So just to summarise then, um, I hope I've convinced you that looking outside of the brain and spinal cord is important in ALS, particularly um, looking at the GI tract. Um, we know from Parkinson's disease that, in fact, neurologists now think of Parkinson's disease as a gut first or a brain first um, type disease, and that we could be um, diagnosing um, or at least finding pathology outside of the brain before people experience significant disability or symptoms and targeting therapies appropriately, targeting therapies to the gut, not just to treat symptoms, but possibly even to prevent uh, the disease progressing. So it could be an early biomarker, but also an important therapeutic target. So just to acknowledge um, my, my team, really lucky to be able to work with um, Dr. Feather Waldron and Dr. Holly Spence in our lab. Um, we're funded by MND Scotland and also we're really fortunate to be able to be funded by Target ALS to develop these RNA aptimus, these better detection tools. And that's done as part of a consortium um, grant where we get to work with Neil Schneider and some colleagues in Italy. Um, and, it's, and it's been a very productive um, funding relationship. And we also collaborate very closely with our colleagues at the University of Edinburgh as well. Um, so I've just included my details here, but please do get in touch. Um, you can find me on Twitter or if you get in touch with Jean, I'm sure she'd be happy to forward my details to you as well. But maybe I um, could stop sharing my screen and then answer any questions anyone might have. Yes, well, thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for that uh, incredibly fabulous uh, presentation. Very interesting. Um, uh, feel free to start uh, raising your hand if you have a question or put it in the chat. Um, I did want to lead with one. Um, so there's an understanding that there's not good uh, TDP43 biomarkers in humans. And like, for instance, I was just in some discussion with um, uh, NIH and industry people, and some industry people were talking about how hard it would be to develop a PET ligand for TDP43. And uh, they were like, why, why even bother? It's so hard. But I'm a little confused as to why that would even be an issue if you could uh, uh, measure the aggregates in these other ways that you've been doing. Um, so can you detail that a bit, I guess? Um, I think that's such, I mean, that's such a great question. And, and you know, in, in truth, it's something that we're really interested in doing. Um, so with these RNA aptimers, they're, they're very um, amenable to PET ligand. Um, so you, you can add a, a radio tracer label onto them. It's been done for Alzheimer's disease. And it's something that we're looking to do with our TDP43 um, aptimer. And because it recognizes shape, rather than the, the particular um, region of the protein, it's much more likely to be able to detect pathology. Um, and it's definitely something that we're interested in looking into and, and actually designing aptimers, not just, you know, the, the problem in neurodegenerative diseases is that these proteins are so tightly folded in these aggregates that these the antibodies can't access the bit that it needs to bind to. And so that's where aptimers get around it. Um, I also think um, kind of as a society, we're, we're much more, um, familiar now than we perhaps were previously with having RNA in us from COVID vaccination, things like that. So 
we, we understand a little bit better how the body copes with having RNA molecules delivered therapeutically um, and you know not just therapeutically but I mean in, in the context of um, the clinic so I feel like that's something that um, yes we're certainly interested in developing. But I guess just to pin that a little more is like people are saying this is not possible and yet you're showing evidence that you've done it in blood and, and these samples and uh, oh I guess you haven't yet done it in blood and fecal that that's TBD right yeah yeah got yeah it, so got it. Oh. Us, uh, but we haven't yet done it in um, in blood and fecal samples that's what we've received funding to be able to look into now um, but in CSF I mean we can visualize individual aggregates which you can't do with with antibodies so we currently only have two very good functioning types of antibodies for TDP43. One of them that recognizes the whole protein, which will recognize everything, including normal TDP43. Um, so it's very, very dirty. It's very difficult to see what's um, abnormal and what's normal. And the other one is the phospho TDP antibody, which only detects a very, very, very small amount of um, abnormal TDP43. Now our aptima, so we, we say one is sensitive and one is specific, but neither have both whereas our aptima has both sensitivity and specificity. And so it really gets around those issues because it's only binding to abnormal TDP, but it really is binding to a huge spectrum of aggregation events. Um, and that's something that Target ALS are working, are partnering with us to look into, is looking at um, this as a, as a potential biomarker. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for walking me through that. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, that was fabulous uh, information. Uh, Wilhelmina, um, uh, yes, uh, well, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, uh, very impressive. Uh, and I understand uh, you uh, uh, did um, uh, you uh, did research of the biopsies uh, yourself. Huh? Can you tell something about uh, in what cells of the uh, gut lining uh, you found uh, these uh, aggregates? Because uh, recently I found out that uh, the vagal nerve and the sympathetic nerve they end very close to the uh, to the epithelial lining of the gut, you know. So mm -hmm. these fibers are very near the lumen of the gut. Yeah. So they're very vulnerable to every noxa that comes around. So that was so, yeah, bizarre. So, yeah. So can you tell me something about... Um, 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 uh, well, uh, this, the 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 uh, specific cells you uh, found these aggregates in or around or near. Yeah. So we uh, that's I mean that like it's really interesting. It's such a great question. So we we actually see very similar to Parkinson's disease and um, CJD. So. Um, where you've got protein aggregates we see them in very similar locations so in these large neurons in the plexus like you're saying that's very very close to the epithelial lining we also see them so just immediately underneath the epithelial lining there's an area called the lamina propria and this is the bit that's supposed to protect us protect those nerves so it's got loads of inflammatory cells in it and it's got lots of macrophages and it's supposed to be protecting us we see lots of aggregates in the lamina propria so we see aggregates in um, what we call dendritic cells, which are from the same from the same origin of, as neurons. We see them in macrophages. So the macrophages are um, trying to gobble up these aggregates, um, and we see them in these large neurons, just as Heiko Brack showed exactly the same um, as he showed in those Parkinson's um, GI biopsies as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Jenna, well, uh, I'm so. Uh... You know, recently I uh, read something about the sympathetic tone, you know, in ALS patients uh, is, um, you know, uh, higher than normal. So I was wondering if you found these aggregates maybe somewhat more in the sympathetic nerve endings than in the vagal nerve endings. Or is it, you know, it, that's something in my head that I'm thinking about maybe the sympathetic nerve is the bad guy or the one that's getting hurt in ALS. Yeah. 
I mean, that's fun. That's such a good, that's a brilliant question. And, you know, it's very difficult for us to address that in the colon biopsies, but it's certainly something that we could look at in the gallbladder, for example. Um, we, we could do stains to look at the different nerves and see their proximity to the aggregates. In the gallbladder, the aggregates are so dense um, that it might be difficult to, to tease that apart. But I think that that's brilliant. And really, people should be doing these studies, shouldn't they? Looking at um, nerve biopsies from different types of, of peripheral nerves to look to see what the, um, you know, what toxicities there are, what relationship there is with these aggregates. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and, and uh, well, sorry that I'm, uh, I'm, it's my third question, but uh, well, you know, uh, the sympathetic nerve endings in the gut uh, wall lining, they are of the beta 3 type, you know, they are different from uh, the receptors in, you know, in the heart or in the blood vessels. Um, can you, well, do you think something about that? because it's very hard to do research on that yeah actually that's something that i hadn't hadn't thought about previously it's really interesting having these conversations isn't it do you know in parkinson's disease um that i was i was mentioning about this gut first or brain first type of presentation where some patients have pathology first in the gut and then it transmits to the brain whereas others have it in the brain and it eventually transmits to the heart so it's it's a very interesting axis and in the same way as you're saying that there could be differential um nerves that are susceptible and we that's something that we should definitely be interested in looking into for sure yeah um richard uh you're next thank you what a wonderful presentation um two questions kind of related and maybe i missed it because i missed the first moments or two of your introduction but the individuals with the biopsies long before onset of motor symptoms have did they go on are these individuals who later develop sporadic als or a mixture of genetic and sporadic and and have they been uh, you know genotyped from the samples later on that's one question and related to that um, is whether there are banked uh, plasma samples, especially for the individuals whose biopsies were closer to the time of their onset of motor symptoms, because if they could be looked at for neurofilament light, for example, because as you know, identifying individuals with sporadic ALS prior to uh, onset of symptoms is, is currently thought impossible, while in the prefals and other genetic tracking studies as you know that there is a potential for that so i'm just curious about those two things i mean that's yeah super interesting and you know they had been genotyped so these the study that we've done we we only selected people who i had done genetic testing on that i knew had sporadic or c9 or 72 because i hypothesized that they would have tdp 43 and that that was particularly what we were interested in i think it's warranted to look also in the sod one population as well but these were c9 and, and sporadic just because we were looking at tdp 43 um and with respect to the plasma samples would be amazing wouldn't it i mean do you know the the thing that we're, we're working in target ALS, we're working with um, Dr. Neil Schneider at Columbia University, and he has this incredible collection. Also, Pam Shaw and Sheffield, they have these incredible collections of um, biosamples from people pre-symptomatically as well as symptomatically. And that's where we're starting with these aptomers to see whether we can detect pathology before people have experienced symptoms. Um, often these are gene carriers as you say rather than um sporadic population but i think it's a really good starting point um we do have some samples where we had paired brain um, and peripheral tissues um, but we don't have any paired serum samples for those unfortunately um, but certainly it's something that we should think about for prospective collection and it is something that we're thinking about with respect to developing these as diagnostic tests uh, Dr. Gregory, uh, I, I, I bet Columbia has my mom's brain and your blood samples <laughs> as a C9 carrier. Uh, but anyway, uh, Karen, um, would you like to go? Oh, Karen, you're on mute. Sorry. Or Karen, you can put it in the chat if you're having trouble. Oh, Karen, I can't hear you still. Sorry.
she lowered her hand. Karen, feel free to put it in chat. And then of course, uh, Dr. Gregory's information was on the slides and uh, feel free to um, email me if you didn't get it. And, uh, or you can put it in the chat, Dr. Gregory too, if you, if you want. Um, so something came up, which I've like tried pushing on uh, Twitter. I don't know if you saw Dr. Gregory <laughs> when some of your information first came out from your lab. Um, you know, myself, I guess Sam also, we send our poop to uh, MGH, Dr. Barry. And uh, every, I don't, what is it, three months, Sam, I forget, but um, on the regular. So they have lots of our poop. Um, are, are you working with them or do you know if they're also doing this? Or I know there's, you know, people working on different things, but yeah. Any, any... So what we're doing currently is trying to reach out to people who have collected samples with broad ethics approvals, because often people have um, requested, so I think a lot of people are doing microbiome studies, so looking at particular bacterial populations, um, but not necessarily looking for biomarkers. Um, so what we're doing is reaching out to people to see if we can use historically bank samples and also prospectively collecting as well. Um, and we, we have some um, new tubes that we, uh, half of the population that I look after are actually on the islands, the, the Scottish islands, actually quite in quite remote and rural populations. So it's quite nice to try to develop tests that we can um, preserve the sample for as long as possible. And so people can post samples to us as well. And that's something that we're doing as part of our prospective collection too. Well, we know in the microbiome study at MGH, there's a lot of carriers in it. So uh, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll talk to them too. Um, I did want to ask a question about, um, there's so much there, um, but I guess the question from your, as, as a researcher, do you think that the, and, and maybe you addressed this and I just didn't pick up on it, but do you think it's like chicken or the egg with the aggregates and the gut issues? Um, like, do you think the aggregates are causing the gut issues? Do you think the gut, issue, gut issues are causing the aggregation? And I guess I'm asking that too, because treating the gut issue stuff with like more fiber or more probiotics, that would be helpful if it was the gut issues driving the aggregation, um, right? Yeah. And it wouldn't be as helpful if, if it, it was- if not rid of the cause, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and it's the same for, for um, brain treatment, you know, brain targeted therapies as well, isn't it? So I think that we, so one, one of the kind of working hypotheses that we've been looking into, especially thinking about other um, neurodegenerative diseases and the role of the, gall, the gallbladder, was something around um, an environment that could be really um, pro-aggregation. So the gallbladder is, is perfect for this sort of an hypothesis because most people who have had their gallbladder taken out is because of gallstones, particularly in this age group. And so you've got um, so gallstones stuffing up the inside bit of the gallbladder and the lumen, and then you've got muscles growing around it to try and um, squeeze against them. And so you've got this you're squeezing the epithelium and the lemon appropriate between the stone and the muscle. And in this squashed environment, you're reducing the volume of the cell. Um, and that means that it's very, very prone to getting protein aggregates and protein clumps. Two other things are going on. One is inflammation. Inflammation lowers the pH of the tissue. Um, these proteins love to aggregate at low pH. They're much more aggregation prone. And then the final thing is the bile, which is being squashed into the tissue which causes lipid vesicles to form because it's dispersing um, fats in the tissue. And these proteins, particularly alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's, loves to aggregate on lipids. And so you've got this perfect storm to create these aggregates, but actually it's gallstones that might have caused that in a way that, you know, once you've removed the gallbladder, you might have got rid of the gallstones, but actually you've, you've still got um, aggregates present in the, in the tract. You know, that's something that um, at least as a working hypothesis could mean that treating um, aggregation could improve, at least improve symptoms, if not um, prevent those aggregates from accumulating to such an extent that they might then spread to the brain. But yes, you're absolutely right. If, we're, if, if aggregation is a bystander, treating aggregation isn't going to help. And um, that's the same in the brain as well, isn't it? I wanted to uh, highlight a question in the chat from Lynn. Um, what inflammation markers are easily tested? Um, inflammation markers in the gut, do you think? Is that? 
Um, because that's something that's uh, really interesting that uh, obviously I'm a, a GI pathologist. A lot of the cases that I see are inflammatory bowel disease, um, not related to neurodegenerative diseases. One of the proteins that we look for in the stool samples is um, something called calprotectin. And that's a marker of um, gut leakiness and um, gut inflammation. And actually we see in ALS, there's, there's been two studies published showing that um, there's increased levels of that in the stool samples taken from people with ALS. So showing this gut leakiness. Um, so we already have uh, many of these markers, but they're not very specific. So it could be anything. You can have those going up in infections or um, other disorders. So having something like that paired with TDP43, for example, could be really informative. Um, but yes, inflammatory markers, definitely. Uh, Wilhelmina? Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, then the next question I have is, uh, well, you told uh, you told about the inflammatory cells you uh, uh, you found in the lamina propria, and, and I was wondering if you think about the immune system, then there is this defensive branch, and there is this branch that is uh, all about tolerating um, pathogens. Um, uh, did you find immune cells that were about defense or more about tolerance? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I guess the other thing is around kind of acute and chronic inflammation and also what's happening to those inflammatory cells. So when I mentioned that one of the um, samples that we, pardon me, one of the samples that we looked at was a lymph node. And so when you get the, when your um, body recognizes a, a pathogen or um, a protein that it doesn't recognize as, as self, um, it takes a bit of that protein to the lymph node and then the lymph node makes antibodies to that protein. Um, and that's exactly where we saw the protein aggregates in the lymph node. We saw it in this antigen presenting T cell rich region in those, in those follicles in the, in the lymph node. Um, so we're seeing that kind of reactivity um, so, uh, and, and actually because it's present in macrophages within the lamina propria, I think linking those two together, it does make sense. Um, whether there is, um, you know, whether, whether there's a way of, um, of, of measuring tolerance, I'm not sure. What, what sort of things would you, um, would you think about? Well, uh, uh, recently I heard this uh, presentation about, um, uh, you know, uh, well, the inflammation in the central nervous system, and this uh, researcher he told that uh, in the central nervous system there normally are no infl inflammatory cells, but when a motor neuron dies, then uh, as a reaction, there comes this uh, this 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 inflammation. So, in this line, I was thinking when. Uh, these uh, vulnerable nerve endings just under the epithelium get hurt, mm -hmm. then maybe there, uh, as a reaction on that, um, they could be reacting. And that's something that people have seen particular T cell responses in ALS as well. And thinking that that could be driven by central nervous system differences is, is one hypothesis, but another one could be exactly as you're describing that this is a response to a peripheral insult rather than a central insult. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, that could be. And I suppose those, um, I'd, I'd have to, I'll have to refresh my knowledge with respect to the literature on that because I'm not aware that people have looked at those T cell um, uh, signatures in pre-symptomatic individuals. That would be something that would be really interesting to look into. Yes, uh, yes, because um, this researcher also told that the, uh, uh, you know, the immune system has two phases when a neuron dies. The first phase is tolerance. And when, uh, you know, the things get worse and too bad, then it, then it becomes a vicious circle, like then the inflammation gets high. So there's no more tolerance in phase two. There's only inflammation. Yeah, and it's very difficult to switch it off as well. And that's something that I was yeah. saying about that kind of restricted environment. You get a lot of swelling um, during those those early stages of inflammation. Um, and that can actually stop inflammation from being switched off because you can't um, unfold these reactive processes. The inflammasome is one of them. 
that we've looked at previously. So once you've got that kind of established information, it's very difficult to switch it off. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to jump in with some other uh, things in the chat, um, someone shared, and I was just thinking this as you were talking about the gallbladder, I was like, with how many C9 people there are, there have to be C9 people having their gallbladder removed uh, during life. And Corey shared that her mom had her tonsils and gallbladder removed and uh, right before her symptoms. Right. So um, anyway, just pointing that out, that surely mm -hmm. that is happening. and. Um, yeah, that's something to think about. Um, and then somebody asked, uh, Valentina asked, do you suggest for ALS patients to use probiotics to increase or to improve their length of life? I think it's really difficult because I, you know, as a, as a clinician, I find it really hard to recommend anything that hasn't been through a rigorous, you know, randomized controlled trial. Balancing that against what I might do if I was in that position, it's very difficult to, to say, isn't it? Um, I think the um, I actually looked at some mouse guts from one of my colleagues who works on um, ovarian cancer, and she showed me that the um, when you irradiate um, the pelvis of these mice, um, they don't get really bad pelvic um, irradiation signs in their colon, so it protects them against um, damage done by radiation. And when I saw those guts, they were, it was so convincing to me that I started increasing the dietary fiber that I eat. <laughs> so there's some things that, you know, influence you. Um, you know, I, I've certainly changed my diet having been involved in that study. Um, it's not always easy to implement and, you know, we're, we're human beings and um, I'm particularly flawed with respect to that. So, but I think, you know, probiotics and um, high vegetable dietary fiber are certainly things that I do um, having been involved in these studies. So, can, can I ask a, a clarifying question on that as, you know, not somebody familiar with the discussion of these things? When you say uh, vegetable fiber, does that mean from uh, eating vegetables or does that mean like, you know, there's, like, what is it, Metamucil? You know, there's supplements, there's fiber supplements you can take. So is vegetable fiber different than that? So in the human study, it was vegetable fiber from, from ingesting vegetables. Um, in the, I know, for example, in the animal models that, um, gel diet, so just physical fiber, um, improved survival and, and motor function. Um, and in in the particular study that I was talking about with the, with the vegetable fiber, they showed that nut fiber and fruit fiber didn't drive the same difference. So it was ingested um, vegetables. So um, and and also legume fiber didn't, you know, like kind of um, rices and pulses. So it was it was very much vegetables, and and they were hypothesizing that it's driven by this butyrate that these bacteria that like to eat you know spinach and things that you don't digest broccoli <laughs> makes it to the colon and um, that they're they're releasing this butyrate that could be protective there there is a question about a veg, vegetable vegetarian diet whether that would be um helpful particularly i'm not sure whether that's been tested um yes i don't know i don't know whether the, the um uh yeah i'm not sure um Richard uh, has a question. Just a comment on what was uh, said. One thing before, actually, your comment, Gene, about the progress or lack of it in uh, pet tracers for TDP43. Um, there was, for anyone who was not at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference a couple of weeks ago, there was a fabulous TDP43 symposium in honor of uh, uh, Virginia Lee and John Trojanowski. And part of that presentation, was uh, by the uh, AC Immune about the progress in their pet tracer, while still preclinical and you know with some question marks, uh, lots of them actually. I think there was a sense of surprising uh, progress uh, given the low abundance of TDP43 in 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 uh, in in the brain in in uh, different cell types and so on but there was progress in, in visualizing this in in preclinical models so some reason for hope not to in any way diminish what what you're doing dr gregory no, with and look i totally agree and, and actually it was something that we were really delighted to be at the target als meeting this year where there's huge amounts of progress going on in, in parallel that um ac immune have also got a um uh, a, a high sensitivity detection tool for looking in blood samples for TDP43, also seeing a signature in platelets, um, so platelets circulating in the blood that have bound to pathological TDP43. 
um, you know, huge amounts of hope. And actually, you know, it's 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 all very complementary, and you know, ultimately, it's all the same goal, isn't it? Um, and you know, if if there's a way that we can detect uh, the, the other thing with the aptamers is that if you can detect um, TDP43 using the aptamers, you can detect FOS and SARG1, and they're very easy to generate. You don't have to generate antibodies with high specificity and sensitivity. It's all done by a computer algorithm that you know detects these these regions that you combine to so definitely and i think i agree with you that all of the data that i've seen presented recently a big phase shift um in als research for me really really promising times i've been in this field for 15 years and i haven't seen as much progress as i've seen in the in the past 12 months so really promising uh, we, to agree with you. we just have a few moments um corey has a question and i i would piggyback on that too is that um you've seen i'm sure this uh c9 mouse uh finding from uh kevin egan um lab where <clears throat> the c9 mice with a different gut biome you know didn't develop the disease and the fecal transplant cured the mice and the antibiotics cured the mice yeah. um so uh, is that fully in line with what you're looking at basically Definitely. and actually some of the data um that was included in those systematic reviews that we've done were including antibiotic treatments um you know really nice there's just been a protocol published recently um for the trial looking at fecal transplantation um you know ultimately these are um much safer therapies than many of the drug trials that we're we're implementing and, and i think that you know detecting pathology early and targeting um therapeutically targeting the gut is just a, a, a very sensible add-on to what we're already doing clinically in ALS. Um, with carriers with gut issues, do you suggest that they should bring this up in their studies they're in? <laughs> I suggest you bring it up with the clinicians. I suggest you bring it up with everybody. Do you know something that, uh, that um, actually upsets me is that um, we don't see any, none of the biopsies that we looked at when we were conducting that study, nobody was having any biopsies taken after their diagnosis. It's almost like people had decided that it wasn't worth it or, do you know, if people have got GI problems, they should be investigated in the same way that everybody is and have biopsies taken looking for underlying treatable causes like infections, for example, or a colitis. Um, so absolutely any um GI problems then bring them up with everybody and I think there's a tendency to say oh those GI problems could be because you're taking lots of morphine for your pain but equally your joint pain and your GI problems could also be part of the um, of the process do you know you know one very, of the pain is that we also see aggregates in the cartilage cells um, and do you know if, and these are also share a lineage with neurons as well. So actually joint pain could be part of it as well. And it's just, it just I feel like clinicians need to also think more about this and um, not just be focused on the, a brain and spinal cord, you know. Um, well, this is all very fascinating and uh, very interesting for all of us, of course. And we thank you so much for the presentation, for all the hard work you're doing um as you as we've said we're all happy to send our poop whenever uh so uh keep us posted <laughs> um so thank you so much um uh we're we're so glad to have had this if there's any last word you have doctor uh before we end i just just thank you thank you to everybody here thank you for such a great discussion i've learned from it as well and thank you so much Jean. i really appreciate everything you do i know what all of us do really appreciate it and thank you so much for inviting me really it's really nice